People with BPD is like emotional burn victims, you know, so like, you know, the slightest touch, they're like in a ton of pain. It's, it's just this endless roller coaster of emotions that just never, never stops. Um, I guess I reached a point where I, I had burned my whole life to the ground um, because that's what I felt like I deserved. One of my housemates kind of walked past my room, I'd left my door open, um, and he, he saw me in bed with a empty bottle of wine next to me and a box of pills empty. The worst suicide attempt I had left me in a coma, so I was in intensive care for about five days. Um, So there's this kind of unwritten rule that these people shouldn't be here. These aren't the people that we treat. I've had crisis people go, oh, well, if you're really determined to end your own life, we can't stop you even if you are in hospital. I've been denied treatment to the point where I nearly died. Um, because of my diagnosis. I was saying, please don't let me go home. Um, I'm gonna kill myself if you let me go home. Um, and they ended up calling security on me and just kicking me out with no further kind of offers of support. Up to 1 in 50 people have BPD, a mental illness associated with intense, overwhelming emotions that are difficult to regulate. It can look different in everyone, but those affected often experience things like anxiety, impulsiveness and an unstable sense of who they are. It's been called one of the most distressing mental health conditions a person can have, but it's also one of the most stigmatised. Even the term borderline personality disorder is controversial, with some saying it suggests there's something fundamentally wrong with who you are as a person. Up to 80% of people who've been diagnosed say they've been discriminated against because of having that label, often by the mental health professionals who are tasked with looking after them. So what actually is BPD? I'm going to meet 24-year-old Jaylan, who was diagnosed six years ago when she was 18. She started struggling with her mental health as a child, and like many others with BPD, first developed symptoms when she was a teenager. So the kind of things I struggled with as I was growing up was lots of anxiety about pretty much everything in my life. Um, but I also struggled with being quite sensitive and struggling to regulate my emotions. I started self-harming when I was 14. Um, I think I was just so overwhelmed by everything. I didn't know how to kind of express what was going on in my head. As well as self-harming, Jelan has struggled with suicidal thoughts for nearly 10 years. She's tried to take her own life several times. I have had suicidal thoughts on and off probably since I was about 14 um, and there have been a few suicide attempts. It, they weren't good <laughs> points in my life and it's difficult sometimes when I'm having a bad day and I kind of wish that I hadn't survived them. Jaylan isn't alone in her experience. Up to 80% of people with BPD self-harm, and around the same number attempt suicide at least once. I'm going to meet one of the world's leading experts on the condition, 
He thinks the emotions people with BPD feel can sometimes be so distressing that self-harm and suicide can seem the only way to cope. BPD is probably the most painful mental health disorder that an individual can have. It is associated with feeling intense anger, feeling intense anxiety, feeling intense depression. But sometimes it's so difficult to control and the pain is so deep that self-harm, attempting suicide, seems like a reasonable solution. BPD can affect anyone, but up to 80% of those diagnosed have survived something traumatic. Many have been abused or neglected as children. Experiences which can shape the way you see yourself and the world around you. I'm meeting 21-year-old Grayson, who was diagnosed with BPD three years ago. He was sexually assaulted and bullied as a young child, as well as struggling with the female gender he was assigned at birth. Like Jaylan, Grayson started having mental health problems at school, but wasn't diagnosed with BPD until he was an adult. So middle school was sort of when things started to get difficult for me because I was an easy target because I looked different and I couldn't sort of behave like normal kids. And then I went to my GP the first time when I was like 11 or 12 for like depression and it was because I was like clawing marks on the side of my leg during class and stuff because I was really struggling. Um, I was sexually assaulted when I was eight years old um, on holiday. It sort of affected me in a lot of um, different ways, like in the school changing rooms, if I thought people were looking at me, I was really angry about it and I was really uncomfortable with it. Um, and as well, like being with um, sort of boys my age, that made me really stressed out as well. Grayson's just started university, something he thought he'd never be able to do because of his mental health. But even though he's doing better, he can still find some things difficult to cope with. I self-harm, still currently. I get quite angry at myself. Like, I know it's a bad thing, but currently it's one of the only ways I can, like, cope. Yeah, like, I guess I get angry at myself for not being more normal and not like sort of doing things that mentally healthy people did. Like in middle school, it was not being able to connect to people. And then in high school, it was not getting the same grades as everyone else was. I guess when I still feel like I'm not measuring up to everyone else, I feel like, yeah, I just feel angry at myself for that. Grayson makes embroidery about how BPD can cut him off from other people. It helps him to express his feelings of isolation and how he often feels misunderstood. This one is about like with borderline and stuff. I sort of feel, you know, like I'm on a different frequency to everyone else. For me, it feels very isolating and like just the signals that I'm sending out aren't the same as anyone else's. What is the bring back B hashtag BPD? What? Uh, that one was like, because Instagram banned that hashtag because it promotes harm. Sort of when you get diagnosed with BPD or when I did, I was very on my own. So they were just like, here's your diagnosis. We don't really like you. Please go. So like all the stuff that I learned about BPD was from other people. But having to learn about BPD wasn't the only problem Grayson says he had to face. To him, being diagnosed also seemed to affect the support he was given. It felt trapping to have that diagnosis because it, it changed how medical professionals like sort of spoke to me and that like my psychiatrist would sort of seem to think that like any emotion I was expressing I was faking and he sort of didn't look at any of my distress as genuine. Um, and my GP, I went to him and he called me a liar. It feels quite trapping when people look at you 
um, especially people who are supposed to help you and they sort of don't see you and that everything that you're doing and all the pain that you're feeling, they don't believe it. And you sort of, you don't know what you do from there. But Grayson didn't just get unlucky. Studies show that some mental health professionals see those suffering from BPD as less mentally ill and less deserving of care than people with other mental health conditions. They're often said to be manipulative, attention-seeking and even untreatable. These attitudes can affect the quality of care they receive, especially in crisis situations. So how do these ideas about people with BPD develop? I'm meeting Keir Harding, an occupational therapist who's worked in the NHS for 20 years. He says they've become so entrenched in the culture of mental health care that staff often start to believe them. I left university not prepared to work with people who hurt themselves. Um, and I was taught by people in work that, well, you can't help them. Um, there's nothing you can do. They shouldn't be here. They're, they don't deserve our service. And I believed that for a long time. So I think the diagnosis of personality disorder does something to the staff around people that suddenly makes them think that they're not as deserving, that they are responsible for their difficulties, that their distress doesn't quite count. Combine that then with staff kind of thinking, oh, there's nothing we can do for them, there's nothing useful, um, they're not serious mental illness, shouldn't be in our team. That's not going to help anybody. Holly was diagnosed with BPD 13 years ago and has experienced this prejudice firsthand. She now works with the NHS as a lived experience practitioner, aiming to destigmatize the condition and improve services for people who are living with it. There's something about this label that stops people from thinking and it just switches off, the humanity switches off. So the last time I was very unwell, I had um, been cutting quite badly, I'd also been kind of ligaturing, and the response that I got from uh, nursing staff was that I was being ridiculous, that I needed to get a grip, um, that I'm supposed to be working in the NHS and I should be doing better than this. So people don't have, have time for you. So why is there such a stigma around BPD? Because the work is hard. Um, you know, when you're working with people that frequently want to die and will do things to try and make that happen, um, that understandably has a, a really um, emotional effect on you. But rather than people acknowledge that impact that, that work has, um, it gets kind of repackaged as resentment and hatred. So how does the stigma around BPD affect those who experience it? Hello. I'm meeting 28-year-old Brian, who was diagnosed with BPD four years ago. He says he's been dismissed so often by mental health professionals that he sometimes finds himself internalising what they've said about him. People say, oh well, if you're feeling suicidal, reach out. Then I'll say I'm feeling suicidal. People will be like, oh, you're being manipulative. You're attention seeking. You know, I've literally been crying there on my own. Nobody's around. And because of that stigma in my head, I'm thinking, I'm being manipulative, I'm attention seeking. I'm like, I literally haven't told anyone anything. And so then I kind of then gaslight myself, like, oh no, I don't feel that way. It's just for attention. And with the stigma as well, and like like people then wonder why people do feel crap about themselves and they are thinking about suicide because there's all these people saying you don't deserve to have people around you you need to change Brian's been single for over a year he says having BPD can make it difficult to form long-term relationships especially when the stigma affects how he sees himself in terms of like romantic relationships that's still something I'm kind of struggling with but it's hard because that's one of the things I want the most. I want like such. I want. A, I want a relationship with somebody. I want somebody to share my life with. But I'll get these intrusive thoughts and be like, "Oh, you need to be anybody but yourself in order to keep people around." And 
that means I don't deserve love or I don't deserve to have people in my life because of this stigma that's out there. And like, again, that's like an internal prison. It's like, hey, well, do I then just stay single forever? So basically, getting to know some woman on a date and stuff, um, but my brain is just telling me that I've done something wrong. That there's something wrong with me. And again, it's just all these thoughts that I'll never be enough for somebody that... These individuals are far more vulnerable than you or I are. And it is at its worst when there is some disruption of an individual's relationships. When you expect a person to be there for you, to support you in, uh, at a time of crisis, and you suddenly feel they're not there. And that, that kind of disruption can lead to mental pain that is, for you or I, unimaginable. Jelan told me that the lowest point in her life was when she was refused mental health support, despite being in crisis. At 19, she was hospitalised after a suicide attempt, but she says the stigma around BPD stopped her from getting the help she needed. So I'd had a fair few months of trying to access community support, um, and I'd had kind of primary care services telling me that um, they don't have the capacity to deal with people with BPD when they have people with real <laughs> mental illnesses. Um, so I was already feeling quite deflated and alone. And so I remember waking up in A&E after I'd overdosed and the crisis team were there to see me. And I remember getting out of bed and just falling onto the floor because I could barely walk. And I remember one of the guys said to me, oh, you know, don't pretend you can't walk. Um, we know you can walk. And it ended, I was saying, please don't let me go home. Um, I'm gonna kill myself if you let me go home. Um, and they ended up calling security on me and just kicking me out with no further kind of offers of support. Um, I found that experience so traumatic that I ended up in a coma about two, two hours later. It might seem shocking that anyone at risk of suicide could be refused support. But Jaylan's story isn't the only one. I've been investigating coroner's reports and found that since 2013, at least 50 people diagnosed with a personality disorder died by suicide after failings in mental health support. Over 40 healthcare providers have been issued with legal warnings by coroners because of these deaths across both the NHS and the private sector. 50 might not seem like that many, but these are 50 people who might not have died had they received the right care. And in over half of these cases, insufficient risk assessments were carried out by mental health professionals. Not only does this show that not enough was done to protect them, but more worryingly, it means that they might not have been seen as high risk. So why are those diagnosed with BPD being let down by mental health services? I reached out to the NHS for comment, but they were unable to provide me with a statement at this time. I'm speaking to Dan Warrender, a mental health nurse who's doing a PhD on crisis intervention for those with BPD. He says when people frequently try to take their own lives, the level of understanding from staff can start to run out. I think what can happen is that because some people diagnosed with BPD can have kind of recurrent suicide attempts, can frequently self-harm and kind of present to mental health services again and again and again. I think there can become um, a, a sense of complacency, really, where practitioners just think, oh, it's just, maybe it's attention seeking, maybe it's um, kind of viewed as if they were really wanting to kill themselves, they would have done it already. So why do you think staff underestimate the risk of suicide? So I think dealing with that, that risk and that worry of suicidality it's really, really anxiety provoking. 
And I think that they're human beings, so it's okay to be scared, to be angry, to be frustrated if people are kind of coming into crisis care again and again and again. But I don't think it's fair to place the problem inside the person with the diagnosis. The problem is always what we're doing. You know what I mean? If we are paid professionals that need to provide kind of appropriate crisis care for people and the care isn't working, then it's not that that person is untreatable, it's that what we're doing is not necessarily right for this person. So despite how the diagnosis is often viewed, BPD is treatable. The recommended treatments are mostly long-term talking therapies, which aim to help people understand, accept and manage their emotions. For some, they can be life-changing. But in 2018, the British Medical Association found that thousands of people were waiting up to two years for the type of therapies recommended for BPD. And although the report said this in itself could be devastating for those affected, it also said these numbers are only the tip of the iceberg. So how can therapy make a difference? I'm meeting 27-year-old Will. Hi. Unlike many with BPD, Will only had to wait eight weeks for treatment after they were diagnosed. They've just moved into a new house. It's the first time in years they felt well enough to live on their own. But it's taken Will a long time to get here. They've had problems with their mental health since they were a child. When I first did start to struggle with mental health was probably quite young, probably around the age of 11 um, when my mum passed away. But there was a lot before that that was, that was difficult for us. We, we struggled growing up and my mum was very open as to why she was a single mum and why we didn't have a dad. And, and she was very open with the, us with the fact that he wasn't a nice man. Uh, so we grew up with stories of an abusive father and that I think that when I think about it now, I think that probably affected me as well as the, the much bigger and more noticeable traumas that came later. At 23, Will had reached a low point with their mental health. After struggling with suicidal thoughts for years, they were screened for BPD. But after the assessment, Will found the thought of having to wait for help too much to cope with. I took the test and they told me that in two weeks they would see me and, and give me the results and we'd decide on treatment. And I, I, I don't know what it was, but I'd, it's kind of like I'd run too many races to, to the next mark. And those two weeks just seemed so far away. And I just, I, I just didn't know what to do. So I, I went home after the appointment, after taking that test, I bought myself a bottle of wine on the way home. Uh, I drank the wine and I lay on my bed and I took a whole box of, um, of my antidepressants. Thankfully, it wasn't fatal, it, it didn't, but I, at the time, I, I didn't know that it wouldn't be. Not long after Will tried to take their own life, they were officially diagnosed with BPD. Will believes their life would have been a lot different if they didn't get the help they needed so early on. I think in my experience with mental health professionals, I've been really fortunate. I think a lot of people struggle with wait times. A lot of people struggle with getting seen by the right person. And I think it definitely would have been a different story if I hadn't gone onto that list and gotten that treatment so quickly. I think I was in such a bad place if, if they'd have told me eight weeks and it had gone on for more than eight weeks, I, it, it wouldn't have been good. I probably would have attempted again and I probably would have attempted with pills that would have been a lot more dangerous. There, are, there is so much more that could have come from my struggles. There's so much more that could have happened to me. And there's so, there's so many lower points that I could have gotten to. I, I don't know why I got such a good such a good experience with the mental health services. I, I honestly couldn't say why, but I am just really thankful that I did.
Will says that getting treatment was the turning point in their life, but many have to wait a long time to get there. And even though BPD can be treated, some people say the label is so damaging that we should stop using it completely. One of them is Professor Peter Kinderman. He says the difficulties people with BPD have should be seen as an understandable reaction to the things they've been through. Um, I think borderline personality disorder is up there as one of the least useful, most stigmatising, most misogynistic, most um, unscientific labels that we have in mental health. I definitely think it should be. I think we should dispense with it. Having a label like uh, borderline personality disorder, it's a key to releasing some of the resources that are available to people. It's just we shouldn't force people to label themselves as having a non-existent disease in order to get services that they should have got simply because the services should be available to them. What do you mean a non-existent disease? Most people who get the label of borderline personality disorder have survived quite significant levels of abuse and discrimination and uh, bullying and those experiences are very real. What's unreal is to say that the things that have happened to me in my life and the consequences for me as a person, because those two things are real, therefore we should call it a disease. I, I think that the label of the disorder devalues people's experience. And I think to say that the disorder is a, a, a myth, uh, an invention, an inappropriate and unscientific way of dealing with people's difficulties liberates us to talk about the reality of our experiences. In 2020, NHS policymakers as high up as Claire Murdoch, the National Director for Mental Health, said this label isn't right and should be reconsidered. So there is a general consensus that the way we understand BPD needs to change. And despite the struggles that come with having that label, many still see recovery as part of their story. It won't look the same for everyone, and it's not about changing who they are. It's about having a future that's not defined by a diagnosis. For Jaylan, it's small things like her dog Hudson that make that future seem possible. Hudson has helped me. He's helped me so much because I got him when I was really feeling quite isolated and alone and just sort of terrified of the world. And then he just sort of brought me out of myself and brought me back into the world when I don't think I would have been able to do it without him. So. I think recovery looks different for everyone, but for me, recovery just looks like kind of coming to some peace with my BPD, I think, and I'm not trying to get rid of my emotional sensitivities. Um, I think it's made me more creative and more imaginative, and sometimes, you know, feeling things intensely isn't necessarily a bad thing. So I'm just looking to be able to manage it. Um, yeah, to just live a fulfilled and meaningful life, really. Even if that means it's alongside it and it's not completely gone. I have definitely grown so much since the diagnosis. In a way, I have already recovered. Not fully. I think recovery is an ongoing thing. And for some people, recovery is never ending. I would love to fully recover and not have it anymore but also I feel like it's part of who I am. Sometimes those really intense happy emotions um, they make my day so when I think about whether I'd like to recover from BPD I think about trying to be okay with the fact that maybe I never will. My focus for the future is just making sure that I can be happy and I can continue to be happy because I've been mentally ill for so long future planning has been so impossible for me. That's sort of trying to do it now is really scary. So I would tell my younger self that um, I think that there will be a point where you can learn to manage everything and that maybe some things won't go away, but they can get better. You don't have to be normal. The, the focus of it is on having a life that you want to live more than anything else.